my name is Uri Hasson. I'm a professor in Princeton University, and this is the second part of the talk in which we're going to see how we transfer memories from one brain to the other and make my brain links to other brains in the society. So, in the first part we saw how my brain patterns doing memory are related to what's happening before. And we saw that by speaking, I'm making your brain responses similar to mine. And now we can combine these two together and ask, can I take my brain patterns that are related to my memories, and by speaking, plant my memories in your brains? So how did we do this experiment? Think about it that I have a brain patterns in my brain that related to what I'm thinking. And now I'm articulating this, evoking my memories and articulate them, so you are listening. And my task is to take the memories from my brain and to make it reconstru reconstructed and appeared in your brain. So how we did it in the lab? We took the movie of Sherlock from the series, from the BBC series, we took the first episode, we took the first 50 minutes, and we saw it to people in the scanner, people that never saw it before. So basically now they have to encode a new memory to their brain. And to get you a feeling of the stimuli, I'm going to play you now 20 seconds from the middle of the episode for your enjoyment. What about these suicides then, Sherlock? Thought that'd be right up your street. Three, exactly the same. Four. There's been a fourth. There's something different this time. A fourth? Where? Brixton, Lauriston Gardens. What's new about this one? You wouldn't have come to get me if there wasn't something different. You know how they never leave notes? Yeah. This one did. Will you come? Okay, so after people watched the movie in the scanner, we did the opposite condition. So what is the opposite from watching a movie in the scanner? It's when you are lying dark in the scanner, there is no input going to your brain, we give you a microphone, and your task is to retell the story to another person. So now you need to use words to evoke your memories and transmit it to another brain. And I'm going now to play you, again, 20 second recording of, of a subject describing the scene that you had seen in the scanner to another person. The recording is going to be a bit noisy because it recorded in the scanner and we do a lot of noise cancelling in the scanner to have a clean recording, so we also have the transcript of the recording. So they have this exchange where Miss Hudson comes in, asks if everything looks okay, and she picks up the newspaper and she's asking Sherlock about the, the murders that have happened and Sherlock briefly looks outside and he sees that there are cop cars and he says that there's been a fourth murder and something must have been different so that's why they're there and just moments later um, the police, the chief walks in. So as you can see it's a very detailed recording and now we can take this recording of the memories of the storytelling of the movie and play it to another group of listeners that never watched the movie and record their brain responses while they're listening. And then we can take the brain responses and compare it to the brain responses of the people that actually watched the movie. And this is how experimentally in the lab we can look on this transmission of memories from the moment you encode it to the moment you tell it to the moment other people listen to it. This is the behavioral responses of one of the storytellers, the listeners. As you can see, we divided, the movie is 50 minutes, we divided it into 50 segments, each is about like 50 seconds to a minute, and as you can see, it took her 22 minutes to tell the 50 minute story. So there is some compression, she's compressing the event, right? But she's mostly telling the events in order, from scene to scene in order, sometimes the remembering is out of order, and sometimes, rarely, she forgets a scene. 
that's remembering most of it. And this is all 17 subjects that watch the movie and recall it in the scanner. As you can see, we have really one subject over here that it took her 45 minutes to describe a 50 minutes movie. See, it's very detailed. But even the subjects that are not as detailed and more compressing, they don't skip events and they tell all of them in the order and in a precise way. And for half the one that telling it in a very short way might be even a better storyteller because they can really compress the movie and tell you only what's important in the movie. And now that we have this like very detailed behavior, we can start to know, okay, what happened in the brain. So how do we do it? We take a given brain area, and because there is a difference in the timing, right, it might take you 40 seconds to see and only 20 seconds to describe an event, we cannot use the temporal correlation anymore, so we use spatial correlation. We take the activity in this brain area and we average over time within this short event, and now we have a brain pattern in this particular episode in the movie, and we see whether this brain pattern correlates with the brain pattern of another subject in, in another condition while they are seeing the same scene. Okay? So for example, we can look on the subject encoding to the subject recalling in the dark scanner. So when he's seeing the movie, this is on the left, and in the right is when he's remembering the when he's recalling the movie. And we can see whether the burn pattern in scenes one are correlate, and we can do it for all the scenes. We have 50 of them. And this correlation has to be stronger than the correlation between different non-matching scenes. So I want to have a particular activation that particular to this moment in the movie, in, in your brain area, when you're watching and encoding. And we can do this analysis across the entire brain. And what we see, we see areas in which the activation, when you're remembering, reinstate the activation when you are watching. And you can see that there is many brain areas that you reinstate. First, you can see that the responses is not similar in the visual cortex. So it's not that you reinstate the images of the movie, but then if you look on other areas, remember the areas that have long time scales and integrate the meaning? This is the area in which you really reinstate your memories in the narrative, because this is the areas that really accumulate the story over time. And now we can see what's happening between the storyteller when he remembers the events and the listeners when they are listening. And remember, the listeners never watch the movie. And again, what we see, only now with spatial patterns instead of uh, temporal patterns, is that by speaking, the brain responses of the listeners become similar to the brain responses of the speaker that is remembering the movie in these other areas that integrate information over long time scales. And now we can really close the circle and ask, is the listeners, while you're listening to the storytellers in the scanners, are their brain responses similar to, to the speaker when you actually watch the movie for the first time and encode it to memory? And to our surprise, this is exactly what we see. It is if the, li the listeners were in the cinema with the speaker when you watch the movie in Code to Memory. So this is now a nice demonstration how you can see that memories, I can really transmit my memories and bring you with me to my past, to my experiences using language. And what is amazing about it is, if you think about it, I can reinstate my memories. I remember who is the detective, who is the murderer, and what was the context where they meet, for example, in a taxi cab. But you didn't see the movie. So when I'm saying London, cab driver, taxi, detective, you have to combine everything in your brain and you have to imagine, right? Because you didn't see the movie, you don't have the memory. And now you see something very deep about the memory system. You can see that imagination and remembering are the same. And this is another demonstration how the past and, and the future merge together. Because for the brain, it's the same to remember stuff and to imagine new stories. And this is perhaps the most interesting result from this study, is following. 
if I'm seeing how much you understood the story of the movie, right, this is on the y-axis, and how much you're similar, your brain responses as a listener are similar to my brain responses while watching the movie, you can see that the more similar you are to me, the better you understand the movie, right? But we had like 17 people that watched the movie, and we used to take only one version of the movie of one subject to play to the listeners. And you can see that there are, you can see all these like 17 subjects over here, and you can see that they are more similar to the person that you listen to. And this means that you don't get an objective description of the movie. You get my viewpoint of the movie. You get the way I understood the movie, right? So it's very efficient. You don't need to spend 50 minutes in the movie. Now I can, you can get the movie in 20 minutes, right? But you don't get the actual movie. You get my perspective of the movie. And now you can ask, wait, if this is the case, what if you have a very strange perspective of the movie? Right? So now you can see that the way you're remembering depends on the way I'm viewing the world. Right? And now we have to complicate a bit our model for communication, right? Because I want to be coupled to your brain, right? And I want to make you similar to mine. But actually, between you and I, there are different memories and different perspectives. So it's not as easy to make your brain similar to mine. In early areas, it, it's easy. I can, I, you know, I can produce sound and your autocot is going to go up and down. It's very easy to be coupled to your sensory system. But if I want you to get me in this high order areas that integrate information over many, many minutes and really depend on all your memories over time, I need to align the way we understand the world. So there is a filter between you and I. And how can we experimentally test these filters? This is the experiment we did. We took a story of J.D. Salinger. Pretty mouth, green my eyes. And in this story, Salinger is very smart to keep it ambiguous. The background is as following. Husband lost track of his wife in a party. He's coming home by himself, very, very anxious. Where is my wife? Take a phone, grab the phone, and call to his best friend and ask him, did you see my wife? Next to the best friend, there is a woman that is lying naked in the bed. And Salinger is very smart not to tell, not to reveal her identity. So you're not really sure who she is. And as a good scientist, we decided let's ruin the ambiguity and simply tell you her identity. We're going to give you a memory or a filter on reality. For one of the groups, we were saying, the woman that is lying naked, this is the wife. She's having an affair with the best friend. Now, in this context, when the husband is asking, can I come over? I really feel lonely and anxious, and the best friend say, no, please don't come, I'm very tired. You know what he say, please don't come. Probably he doesn't want to be caught. But in the second context, we give for other subjects we told, the wife is loyal, the husband is jealous, the naked the woman is the girlfriend of the best friend. And in this context, when the husband wants to come and the friend say no, you say, oh, This is an annoying friend. It's the middle of the night. You want to go to bed. So we have a very different interpretation. And now, after we tell you this context, everyone listening to the exact same story. There is no difference between them. The only difference is their memory of the context that happened before the story starts. And you can see that this memory is going to change the way they process the story. And now, I can see I can train a classifier and say, this is the responses from these particular brain areas in all the people that believe in the first context, that the wife have an affair. This is the responses in this brain area in all the people that believe that the husband is jealous crazy. And after you learn the similarity patterns across people, I'm giving you a leave out subject. This is his brain responses. And now you need to guess. 
And if you are guessing, 50%, you're going to say the right answer, right? But once we learn the similarity across people, we can predict in 90% accuracy whether you believe that the wife has an affair or the husband is crazy jealous, only based your similarity to other people in the group. So this means that his memory is going to make you more similar to people that think like you. Right? And now, basically, so this is like a summary of the result, right? You're going to be more similar to people in your group. And now you can ask, wait, if this memory is are so effective in changing my brain, if someone tell me the wife have an affair and it's going to change the way I perceive reality, then it's really important from where I'm gathering my information because it's going really to change how I'm thinking. I have a different perspective on reality. And now you can ask, from where do you get the stories? Right? Because now you can see that your memories are shaped by other people, the way they are thinking. So it's really important to ask, from where do we get our information? And I think the, the, the most of the information we get from other brands, from our friends. So tell me who your friends are, I will tell you who you are. So look on your family, look on your friends, your group of people that you are connected to. They're going to say how you think. And then, of course, you have to see who else is influencing your brain. For example, which TV news you are listening to, right? Which newspaper you are reading. And you have to realize that by reading one source of information, you get some perspective on the world, and it's going to be very different from another person. Right? So now it's really important now also to think about what is the common input for us as a society. And, and a way to summarize it is to say that my memories are your stories, and your stories are my memories, and we are all connected together to a big web. So now, if you really want to understand human cognition, you cannot study individuals in the box. You need to understand how we connect to other people. And now this like way of connection constantly shape who we are and move us from who we are now in the present to the future. So there's a constant dynamic between our past and our futures. And our current futures is connected to other people. And this is how we are all like a big web. And in a way, what we do in our lab is study this connection because people, and now one person influenced another person. But that will be another story, and for that you need to go and read our other papers that are coming out from the lab. Thank you so much.